And welcome back, everyone, to yet another episode in this fourth season of Dane and Derek. This week, we are going to be discussing uh, Studio Ghibli's The Boy and the Heron. So if you have not seen it, this is probably not the episode for you. Come back after you've seen it. Or if you haven't seen it, but just don't care. Oh, because yeah, I, I, I think I've gone on record here saying that I am definitely a person who's like, if if your story can't stand without its twist, I'm not sure it's a good story. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, or like if it's been spoiled and it's no longer any good, probably uh-huh. wasn't that good to start with. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that it doesn't might not dilute an experience, to be sure. I just I, I, I definitely have the feeling of like if there's if it can't live, like if it's not worth seeing without, you know, the thing, yeah. then I, mm, yeah, okay. you know, yeah. Empire Strikes Back is worth seeing if you know that Vader and Luke are related. It right. Like, <gasps> I know, I know. I don't mean to spoil a yeah. 45 year old movie. Oh man. They're turning 50 soon, huh? 44. 44. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. 44 year old movie. Huh? Well, there we um, go. But yeah. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Derek. Yeah. And that's Dane. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and Anyways. We're just, yeah. We're listening to uh, it. Uh, Let's talk about our boy Hayao's new movie. <laughs> our boy. Oh, I my God. To say that I can so sense long. him like hating me from a distance. Wow. <laughs> oh, he'd hate that. Anyways. Yeah. Yes. Our boy. <laughs> our boy made a movie. Yeah. So proud of him. <laughs> yeah, so proud of him. Uh, no, but for real, though, it was a real achievement. I mean, it was like seven years in the making, eight years in the making. And then yeah, it, it was, you know, there was almost no marketing released. And I Top guess like... charts, right? Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, no, it did. It charted internationally, Japan yeah. and in the US. Yep. And so I guess right off the bat, Dane, boy in, the boy and the heron. Did you like the movie? Uh, yeah, I loved it. Honestly, it's how would I put this? It's one of his most magical movies. Yes. And one of his most difficult. Yes. Um, at the same time. Uh, and for that reason, uh, it hit all the right notes for me. I went with Gracie, um, my mom, my sister, my brother, and my uncle, and I think Gracie and I were the only two who were like 100% hot over heels for the movie. Um, and I think that that's about right. Um, that doesn't mean Gracie and I are special or anything, but like, I think it's only going to fully hit for some people. Yeah. Um, because I don't, I don't think it was made for m- more than one person. Yeah. I think he made this movie for himself. And that means that it's going to be intensely personal and it is going to turn a significant number of people off, even if there's a lot of enjoyment to get, even if it's still not going to be your favorite of his or like it all that much. Like, I don't think anyone could argue that it's just drop dead gorgeous as per usual. But there were a couple scenes in there where I was like, oh, this is a special level of pretty. Um you know, I, I yeah. would point to the meeting of the grand of the grand uncle on the hill where there's like the stone that is the world yeah. as one of those where I was just like, fuck, this is wild. Um, I think about the opening with the fire. Oh, yeah. That whole sequence. Like the fire was like, it's so such an interesting texture. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Like yeah. It, I th- like visually by itself, it's arresting. Um, you know, I think everybody gave like a hell of a performance. Robert Pattinson's chief among them, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I, I want to say this: like Mark Hamill is a renowned voice actor. Um, you know, and to for him to not be the standout voice actor in a film. Well, that's a hell of a thing. Good job, Robert Pattinson. Like, truly. <laughs> you know, and, and like Christian Bale's role as the father, I, I quite liked his performance as this kind of like, with this kind of like Jersey accent. I really <laughs> liked it. Um, and the Don't young man you worry, whose Mahito. name is escaping me, um, who, who, you know, who played Mahito. Yeah. 
he did phenomenally and like stood up there with everybody, you know, and, yeah. and that's, that's also an accomplishment. Like he was surrounded by, you know, world-class talent did great. So like, if you just go for the acting, like yeah. that's going to be phenomenal. Like everything about it, I think hit and fired on all cylinders, but the story itself is very esoteric. It's pretty damn vague. Um, a lot of things are not resolved cleanly or clearly, even though I think they are in fact resolved. Mm -hmm. And I think that the subtleties and pain in the movie are make it difficult, yeah. right? Like, and it's magical realism, which is a hard genre in general. I should know. I write it. Um, and it's not like My Neighbor Totoro, which is also magical realism. My Neighbor Totoro is has a nice, satisfying ending, is very clear throughout, and is... It's not as vague. It just isn't, yeah. right? I, I would put this alongside that as opposed to putting it alongside... Like, I think I think about um, Princess Mononoke, Howl's Moving Castle, Ponyo, um, you know, certain films that are just so very clearly fantasy, mm -hmm. and then his films that are not clearly... It's not clear exactly how much of this is real and how much of it isn't. Yeah. Um, and then his, like realism films right like i would put this in his magical realism right in the middle yeah. section um and but i would say it's distinctly not as whimsical um and i'm, I'm kind of beating around the bush a little bit here because it's really hard to it's difficult to explain like i i can feel myself struggling to talk about the movie because it is such a challenge Yes. Um, so I'm going to stop talking for a second and I want to know how you felt about it. I, I really loved the movie. Uh, I, I saw it twice, subbed mm -hmm. and dubbed. Um, and I, I, I really want, uh, I mean like the sort of Hollywood brain of mine is like, oh yeah, it'd be great if Robert Pattinson won best supporting actor for this character. Um, that'd be wild. Uh, and then it would also be wild if this film won both best animated feature film and best picture. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just I putting that it. out there. I think I, th I, I think this it, could but... be a landmark year. <laughs> um, I I I think he I think Pattinson deserves that award, mm -hmm. but I I, I just I, don't it, see it. No, it's it's not going to happen. But I think some some acknowledgement of that would be cool. Yeah, the some acknowledgement of this film beyond the animation realm would be great. Yeah. Has, has best picture ever gone to an animated film? I don't know. I don't think so. I'm gonna I'll, look have, that to, up I'll have to look that up. Maybe we can do a, an Oscars episode this year. Finally, <laughs> maybe, I don't think we've done one. I, it's, we've done that many episodes that I, I need to make sure we haven't done it. But going back to this movie, I, I think it was one of those movies where I was in the right, right place, right time to absorb it. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, like, I've been really thinking a lot about family and, like, just, like, childhood and, like, sort of, like, imagination and just, like, interpersonal relationships. And I think, like, the film, like, really hit me in a really hard, heavy way that I think I was not expecting. Um, I think the the sort of, like, okay... <sighs> these are some random thoughts that I kind of have been circling around and kind of using as a way to describe the movie to people, which are, um, I think video essayists are going to ruin the movie. <laughs> um, huh. cause I think yeah, they're going to they read are. into it way too much, you know, and I, somehow not enough. Do you exactly. Know I mean? yeah. Exactly. And so I think like, don't watch any video essays. That's been my sort of opinion of it. Like just, just kind of absorb the movie and just like, let yourself feel it. Don't, don't try to understand it. There's um, no right answer. There's correct. no solving this movie. It exactly. is what it is. Yeah. And the way it's air quotes solved is by meeting the audience and having you complete the film. Exactly. There because is no, nobody is going to get a right answer. And I doubt Miyazaki is going to tell us what he thinks his right answer is. Exactly. So 
yeah. don't bother. Like, exactly. I think that's a great point. Sorry, I keep going. Also, no, I, yeah. did fi- I did find out about um, Best Picture for Animated. It appears that only three animated movies have ever been nominated, period. Okay. And none of them have won. Gotcha. Um, well, there we go. It's uh, 91, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Up in 2009, and Toy Story 3 in 2010. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I mm, man, I disagree with a lot of that. Anyways, yeah, I know, we right? probably should do an Oscars episode. Uh, anyways, yes. we'll put that on the back burner. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think I think that's like the f- biggest thing I've been telling people because I think I think any amount of trying to, I think like there, there's a there's a there was a really good video essay, ironically, that came out about how we search too much for plot. And like plot holes and how plot holes and plot don't really matter as much as like experiencing the emotions in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I think just experience the movie, I think. And then the, the other one other thing is uh, in the end credits of the movie, there's a little section where they uh, thank all the animation studios that helped make the movie. Mm-hmm. And I think what's really beautiful about that section is that all of those studios have Ghibli alum at them, either started or our friends of the studio or friends of friends, you know? And so it really felt like a community of animation studios that really pulled resources together to make this movie happen. Mm -hmm. And I think like, you know, in the movie, there's a lot of themes about legacy. And I think that little end credits thing is what gave me closure to those ideas about legacy. Um, Because there's like, you know, 10 animation studios and like seven of them are all started by like Ghibli people. I'm pretty sure. So yeah, it's like, it's really cool to see that. Um, and then, um, Joe, uh, his, she's his, uh, score is, uh, really good. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's re- it's different, I think than some of his other work. It's haunting. Yeah. Uh, I, I have the soundtrack. I listen to it when I drive, uh, whatever the, the gray, heron theme <laughs> yep. comes on it's terrifying in the car um but i don't know i think um yeah th- those are some uh thoughts i think there's also thoughts surrounding like i think one of my favorite lines in the dub is when christian bale says don't you worry mahito daddy's gonna get vengeance on whoever did this to you um it's yeah. just, I think the delivery on that line is really good. And it's like very, it just feels, you can't help but like laugh at sort of this goofy dad who's trying to be so masculine and serious. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think I, I really, um, I don't know, the fantastic stuff is, is, is great. I think the, I think what I really loved is that the movie felt like an adventure. It felt like a Dungeons and Dragons adventure. It felt like a classic sort of like we're going on a quest to go do something movie. And I just feel like they don't really make a lot of those anymore Mm -hmm. Um, in that, in that sort of story structure. Um, And I, and I really enjoyed that. And uh, yeah. And I think like, I think the big takeaway I had um, was just the sort of like, uh, the like goodbyes element of it and how like it's a film about like it's a film about so many things but like there's one particular scene at the end where um Mahito and Lady Himi like say goodbye to each other and it's this like moment where you realize like oh like it's a you know like it's a mother and a son who didn't really get to spend too much time together in mm-hmm. real life but they got to go on this wild adventure and got to spend that much time. And what's really tragic is he's going to (laughs) forget. They're both going to forget. But yeah, that was just like something that I have had sitting on my mind. I Um, I think, I think something about the film that's really important is that a lot is left implied. Yeah. Um, Like for a very long time, if, Um, if, if at all, if at all explicitly resolved, that's one of them. Like Lady Himi is not explicitly said to be Mahito's mother until very, at the very end. Yeah. They don't actually confirm until then. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, or like 
it takes a little while before somebody straight up says that, um, oh, her actual name's escaping me, but the uh, Mahito's uh, stepmother oh, is his mother's actual si- sister. sister. Yeah, Natsuko. Um, yeah, Lady Natsuko. Yeah. Um, which, uh, that's loaded, right? Like, when you when that clocks, like, Mahito's very stiff and confusing interactions with her early on make a lot of sense right they they start making more sense because that's kind of like a like what a weird thing right like like okay this is not just my stepmom but she's now with my dad was this like that's complicated that's really complicated yeah you know and then there's the whole part where she says she hates mahito Mm -hmm. right and that doesn't get like it's never said that, oh, Lady Natsuko suddenly or or is now okay with Maito and is right. over these like internal feelings of resentment that she clearly was like compressing. Yeah. Right. Um but at the same time, it's there's also this the the point at which like when does Mahito stop referring to her as Natsuko or the lady that my dad likes and starts calling her mother? That's a very interesting change, and it's never quite directly addressed. Yeah. But it's, it's very clear, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, and yeah, and I, and I think that's part of the beauty of this movie is that nothing's clear, you know? Like mm-hmm. everything, like, um, you know, there's that whole thing in Princess Mononoke about seeing with eyes unclouded. Mm hmm. You know, this whole movie requires you to really focus and like look at it without thinking about anything. Like, because I think, the, you know, like you could look at it in the context of his life, his like Hayao Miyazaki's real life. You could look at it in context of animation or the studio or just like other world events, you know, and you could it draw. Strikes, it yeah. strikes me as a meditation. Yes. With a very straightforward story, right? Mm-hmm. Like you said, it's it's a very classic story, you know. It's go to the strange place and rescue the person. Yeah. That is, that is a very classic story, Mm -hmm. right? And it's a classic story that's very strong. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a really solid set of bones. It's not, it's not groundbreaking, but it's a solid set of bones on which to then meditate on 10,000 things. Right. Like we haven't even talked about the fact that like the grand uncle was like, Hey, Maito, Come be God. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. right. Like we've been focusing on other sub aspects yeah. or I don't even know if I'd call them sub aspects. They're just different, different areas to focus on. Yeah. And I would also love to throw out there that a lot of shots and a lot of um, moments have this indie film quality or this, um, this very mature film style. Like there's the scene where Mahito gets into the fight and then he hits Mm. himself with the rock. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It, he doesn't explain why he hits himself with the rock. We don't get any monologue. We don't, we we are. And, and it's just like this, like one hit. And then like, we kind of just like the blood comes and we just start moving on. Right. Yeah. Um, and the thing about that is that like, we then learn later that he's lying, right? Like he did that to be like, listen, I fell. I, I got hurt. Like I didn't get into a fight that I started or right. Like, yeah. and it's clearly a cover to protect the other boys from uh-huh. his father who yeah. he knows could make their lives hell. Uh-huh. Right. Um, for any number of reasons. And there's also a subtext of, is he just self-harming because he's straight up d- depressed because his mother died? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like there's all these layers to it Uh huh. and it's not a hundred percent clear and it doesn't need to be all, all the things, yeah. right? Like it doesn't need to be only one there. And that's why the video essay thing, like you said, it's a great piece of advice because there isn't a right answer. Yeah. Right. There, there never will be. There never will be, but I think it says a lot about, it grants this immediate depth to the character that both makes him 
very relatable from a position of like of like wow that is a person in pain and also it makes him very likable in a sense of like this is a person who we just saw kind of get into a fight which is kind of a mean thing to do and he's being pretty rude to this woman who's trying really hard for him um but he will cover for them at the expense of his own body right like okay he's just having a hard time but he's a good person yeah right like that's a lot to say in a very short amount of time but you ha- like you said you have to be paying attention yeah you you cannot it will not spoon feed it to you this i think the thing about this film to me is it's like the it's like an anathema to modern cinema yes modern i should say modern blockbuster cinema yeah um even modern blockbuster cinema at its like peak which I might, to use the animation, I might point to something like Spider-Man, um, the Spider-Verse movies with oh, Miles yeah. Morales. Like I might point to those as like the very best that that genre can produce and this era can produce. Those films are still hyper fast paced. They lay everything the fuck out for you. Mm-hmm. Um, they're ju- they're beautiful. I would say at least in like they compete with this film in, in beauty for sure. But like you can kind of sleepwalk through those films story-wise and you're going to get it right. There's some, there's some subtext there and a lot to dive into to be sure, but they're in those films. They lend themselves to video essays because there are correct answers. The film is laid out for you that way. Yeah. This is the opposite of that. You cannot sleepwalk through this movie. If you hop in, you are going to be lost. You are going to be confused you might still have a good time because the whole thing is kind of confusing and makes you feel a little lost, which I think is correct. Yeah. Right. Like I think that's the idea. Cause the world he's in for most of the movie is confusing and he feels lost in it. Yeah. This is an example of a film that makes you feel something without like all the elements of the movie make you feel something, which is like what's the film is supposed to be doing. But I think a lot of film these days, you know, they're contentified. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. They just, uh, you know, it's, it's like fast food. This is art, not content. Yeah, exactly. And I think, and yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that, that's a, yeah, that's Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> i think um, that's i think that might be the note yeah because we're, we're we're about at time definitely but overall see this movie see this movie again yeah i hope i hope it gets nominated for some stuff at least if yes i, I hope I, so it would be I, good i feel like it would be it would be real a real slap if they did not um yeah yeah i can't think of another animated film that could compete with it this year so no yeah i think that one might be more or less in the bag but yeah on the other hand who knows, who knows? also the oscars bleh, bleh, <laughs> bleh, i say bleh. um mm. but well, that's an episode for another time yes an episode for another time when it's closer to oscar season uh mm-hmm. which uh yeah anyway i think one final thought because i'm curious mm. who mm. do you think the gray heron is Um, in, in what, in what sense do you mean by that? Just, just like, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Like, like when the gray heron says that forgetting's good and disappears, who do you think the gray heron is? Uh, comes to mind one of two ways. Um, the gray heron uh, honestly strikes me as both a Tom Bombadil style character in which he is himself and he is a little bit outside the story. Uh. Um, and he also strikes me a little bit as a life of Pi tiger sort of figure uh-huh. in which he might also be Mahito. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. The internet would tell you things like, oh, it's Toshio Suzuki. Oh, it's Isao Takahara or it's Hayao Miyazaki. But I, I'm convinced that the gray mm. heron is Mahito's little brother. Mm. because of how they bicker anyway that's all mm. i got see uh, all of those sound correct to yes me. and that's be- and that's the beautiful part right even like all all everything we've just said it's all correct mm-hmm. um, art not content <clears throat> art not content all right 
Well, thanks everyone. Uh, go see Boy and the Heron. Uh, it'll probably be streaming on Max, which is probably. where I think all the Miyazaki films are. But if you can catch it in theaters, go catch it in theaters. And also, whenever when go every year, there's a Ghibli Fest. Yes, where all of these films, a lot of these films, come back to theaters. Highly would recommend. Definitely. Did that this year. Super worth it. And I'm sure this will come back as well. Yeah. Cool beans. All right. All right. Catch you later. Catch you later.